Hello everyone, welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel and this one is going under the AAAS Author Journal Series and I am super happy to have Sarah Blunt with us today. Hi Sarah. Hi. Where are you at? I'm in Southern California in Pasadena right now. Ooh, okay, so uh, how are things uh, pandemic-wise in that part of the world? Not great. <laughs> Not great, yeah. Well. Yeah, there are lines out the door at the um, at the urgent care that's a block away from my apartment. So okay. no fun. Yeah, we're not, I'm not too far from you over here in Phoenix and we're not doing so great either. So yeah, um, yeah hopefully we, we get over that. Mm -hmm. So what do you like to do for research, Sarah? Uh, so I'm interested in both radio velocity fitting of exoplanets and uh, direct imaging. Uh, I'm, I would love to be able to combine those techniques to sort of extract the most amount of information we can from planetary systems. Okay, cool, cool. And that will lead us into this lovely paper that Sarah has headed up. And so we're gonna put the paper up and this is, this is Orbitize, a comprehensive orbit fitting software package for the high contrast imaging community. Sarah, take us away. Great, thanks so much. Uh, so. Uh, first, I want to start off with a little bit of motivation uh, about why I think it's important to um, to write open source astronomy packages. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, making something open source and usable by a broad community decreases the number of bugs uh, you get by implementing things over and over again. Absolutely. Um, it's also a really great so Orbitize serves as a sort of central repository for techniques and know-how in the community. And um, this is important because orbit fitting for directly imaged planets is really difficult. Um, so direct imaging has an observational bias towards large planets that are far away from their stars, uh, which makes sense in order to be able to distinguish the light from, of the planet from the light from the star, it needs to be far away um, and also needs to be pretty bright. Uh, but the fact that these planets are so far away from their stars means that they have really, really long orbital periods, like on the order of hundreds to even thousands or tens of thousands of years. Wow. Okay. And so uh, if we observe them over human timescales, uh, we're only going to ever see a tiny fraction of the orbital period. Uh, so we would like to be able to turn those tiny fractions into uh, information about the orbit. Uh, but because of this tiny orbital cover, this tiny uh, fraction of fractional orbital coverage, the posteriors we get on um, on the orbital parameters are usually very wide, and so right. sampling techniques are very uh, require a lot of sort of creative thinking. Uh, so, people, myself included, have been working for a few years, for many years, on um, on techniques to 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 get around this problem. Um, but it's, I think there's a, there's a sentence in the paper that I like that, yeah, it's, it's often left as an exercise to the reader to implement debug and combine these techniques. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, hey, let me ask you a question. Um, and maybe mention this later on. So, um, so, you know, we only get a very tiny fraction of the orbital period because uh, we just haven't been observing that long. And so, as you mentioned, that gives you a pretty wide range on on the uncertainties in the orbital parameters. So mm -hmm. I'm just sort of curious what sort of a rough derivative of that would be. So for every, on a hundred year period, let's say, just put a number on it, if we um, observe for another 10 years, how much does that improve the orbital parameters? Or maybe that's too hard of a question, I don't know. It's a really good question, and I'm going to totally punt and say, A, we don't know, and B, it depends on the orbit. <laughs> um, based on the properties of the orbit, like for an eccentric orbit, for example, um, information density is very peaked around periastron. So if you can observe, you know, for 10 years of over an 100 year time scale at periastron, that's much more valuable than observing for 10 years at astron when it's only going to move a tiny, tiny bit. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the last point in sort of the introduction uh, to the paper I wanted to make is that even though we have very wide posteriors, 
uh, they're still useful. Uh, we can still learn a lot of things about the, the orbit of the system uh, from just these, from these very wide posteriors. And uh, so we've got a bunch of examples here, but uh, one I wanna point out is uh, misalignment of the orbital plane um, with uh, the stellar spin axis. So mm -hmm. This is a really interesting sort of direct tie into planet formation. And um, orbital inclination is actually generally very well constrained from uh, even these tiny arcs. Uh, so we can get that information really. Uh, so that information is very valuable still. Mm -hmm. so we would still really like to be able to do this. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, okay, so I've covered why we wanna do orbit fitting for directly imaged objects and why it's important to do this in an open source uh, Python package, sort of community-based way. Uh, so I'll go on to section two, if you don't mind, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the code itself. Uh, so, sorry, actually, not the code yet. <laughs> um, so part of the goal in writing this paper uh, was to just, uh, was to educate and uh, put all of the information that you need in order to get started doing orbit fitting in one place. Um, so we have a couple of sections that go through how you define the orbit, how you actually do Bayesian orbit fitting. Um, and we carefully define all of our parameters. Uh, so figure one shows uh, a screen capture of a, uh, of like a, a, an interactive Python module that I wrote to help users visualize the orbitized coordinate system. Uh, so I, the version in this paper is static, but I have, an, I have the interactive version pulled up on my computer. Oh, let's take a look at that. So I'm going to stop the share and we're going to take a look at an interactive figure. Cool. All right. Um, it's pretty slow just because over Zoom. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, which is okay too, because we don't want that dot squirreling around so fast. That <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is a Jupyter Notebook, yeah? <laughs> yep, yeah, exactly. Uh, so this is uh, all the code to, to generate this figure is here. And then all you need to do to run the notebook is pull it up and uh, click run. And this figure is generated here. Okay, so, so here. Yeah, so uh, in the top panel, we see the projection of the orbit on the sky. Uh, so this is just uh, delta RA and delta deck. The pink star shows the position of the primary. Uh -huh. And then the planet itself is orbiting on this orbital track here. Uh, the line of nodes is this dashed black line. And then the sort of transparent part of the orbit is behind the plane of the sky. And the solid part is in front yeah. of the plane of the sky. Okay. Uh, in the second panel, we have uh, the stellar radial velocity over time. So the radial velocity of the primary. Um, and then on the bottom here, there are a bunch of sliders uh, for each of the orbital elements. So as an example, if I increase eccentricity, you uh -huh. can see that the shape of the orbit changes here and also the shape of the stellar radial velocity curve uh, is here. Uh, this shows how, how much information is in this sort of uh, periastron part yeah, of the radial lot. velocity curve. Yep. Uh, I can also play with the inclination. Yeah. Uh, the position angle of nodes. Cool. Which doesn't affect the stellar radial velocity. Big omega. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and little omega. Uh, and little omega, the argument of periastron. Yep. So that won't change the amplitude of the stellar radial velocity, uh, but it will rotate the orbit inside of the orbital plane. So it changes the location of the, of, uh, the periastron. Oh, so question. So how many, um, how many directly imaged planets do we have right now that we could run orbitize on? Good question. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's on the order of, so planets probably on the order of like 10 or 20. Okay. Um, but the cool thing about orbitize is that you can run it for any visual binary. So you can run it for binary stars. You can run it for like brown dwarf uh, uh, stellar binaries or brown dwarf binaries. So anything where you see two objects and you see orbital motion, you can run orbitize. Nice, nice. Cool. The last thing I wanted to point out is that in this notebook, I have uh, some uh, descriptions of the orbital elements and words mm -hmm. as well. Cool. Okay, let's go back to the paper. 
All right, so I'm not really gonna go through the math of uh, how we define the orbit or Bayesian orbit fitting aside from what I already did. Uh, just I'll point out that it's there. Yep. Uh, and then I briefly wanted to touch on different algorithms for orbit fitting. Um, so one of the main draws of Orbitize that I see is that it has several different backend algorithms that you can use to compute posteriors. Um, and based on the properties of your orbit, uh, one algorithm might be better than another. So uh, the Orbitize API allows you to very easily, it's very flexible and allows you to easily uh, you go from using one algorithm to using another. Uh, so the two primary, two, two of the most important algorithms that we have implemented in the code right now are first the orbits for the impatient algorithm or OFTI, uh, which is a modified uh, Bayesian rejection sampling algorithm. Okay. So OFTI works best for very, very unconstrained posteriors. Uh, so the more similar your posterior is to your prior, uh, OFTI will work better. So this is good for basically when you have like a linear trend in separation or position angle, uh, Ofti is able to get you posteriors really fast. Uh, and then we also have a parallel tempered uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. So parallel tempering uh, is, makes it easier for uh, MCMC methods to explore wide and sort of weirdly covariant post, uh, parameter spaces. Uh, so once you get past that regime where you have a sort of linear trend in separation or position angle and you start seeing some curvature in the orbit, uh, switching over to parallel tempered MCMC is sort of the move. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So if we could keep going down. Yeah, so the next section of the paper is how we design the code. Uh, I won't talk too much about it other than to say that we use a mixture of uh, functional and object-oriented programming. Uh, basically the parts of the code that need to, that are run most often, like the parts that need to be very fast are optimized as much as possible. So our Kepler's equation solver is written in C and we've got a couple of different algorithms for solving Kepler's equation as well, depending on uh, the values of the orbital parameters you start with. Um, yeah, so we've, we've optimized that part of the code as much as possible, but in other places we've prioritized readability. Um, we've designed the API to be, as, uh, to be easily modifiable and flexible. So as new techniques and new uh, types of data uh, become available to, to um, high contrast imaging folks, uh, we want them to be able to easily incorporate those techniques into Orbitize. Cool. So keep going. All right, so uh, figure two is a comparison of the two uh, algorithms for solving Kepler's equation that we have. Yep. Uh, there are, <laughs> there's uh, a couple of different things that we're showing here. So on in the leftmost panel is the number of iterations that you need to converge uh, as a function of eccentricity versus mean anomaly. So you can see that as you get to extremely high eccentricities, uh, you require more iterations, but basically for all parts of parameter space that we're generally uh, integrating over, it takes, you know, only a couple of iterations right. at most five or something. Um, and then we have a uh, time to convergence on the rightmost panel that's sort of analogous to the number of iterations. And then in the middle panel, we have uh, the, the absolute error, uh, the absolute difference between the eccentric anomaly values is sort of the output. So what's the error in the uh, differences between these two methods? And, you know, in every region of interest, it's uh, less than 10 to the minus five, 15 difference. So this middle figure is basically to say that both of our algorithms work equally well. Interesting. <laughs> so, Oh, it's an absolute. Never mind. Okay, I got it. Uh -huh. okay, cool. And then the next figure right below this is a sample output from Orbitize. Uh, so this is one of our trademark beautiful uh, orbit plots. Uh, purple is definitely the, the Orbitize color. <laughs> uh, so we try to use purple in as many places as possible. Cool. 
Uh, so on the left hand side, we're seeing 100 orbits uh, drawn from our posteriors. Uh, and the color indicates time uh, elapsed on a given orbit. Uh, so this gives you a sense of, you know, what, what different families of orbits uh, fit the data that you have. So each, each one is a, a, single, uh, a single period orbit that's shown. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Each one is a permissible orbit uh, drawn from the posteriors. It's consistent with your data. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see that there's several different families of solutions. Uh, there's sort of, uh, can you see my cursor? Probably not. Uh, probably not, but I can point out here if you sort of guide me. Okay, yeah, so there's sort of these uh, oblong eccentric orbits that are uh, towards, yeah, those ones. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then there are the more circular shorter period objects as well, planets as well. And then you have some really exactly. big semi-major axes. Yeah, so the semi-major axis posterior generally looks like, uh, like this. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know, there's like a tail to very long periods. Uh, so those are the okay. those objects that you're seeing. And then uh, the right hand panels, we're seeing the same orbits. So each gray track is one of the orbits. Um, and just in a, a different view of it is just how position angle and, se and separation are changing over time. Uh, so you can see that for this particular, uh, for this object over the range of interest, we really only see a linear change. Uh... Right, and then presumably as more data comes in, those um, half angle cone openings get smaller. Exactly, yeah. So all of the data for this system is around uh, like 2010. So that's why it's most yeah. constrained uh, there. And then you have these big fans of uncertainty opening to either side. Mm -hmm. So if we were to get another, uh, so you know, uh, another data point in 2025 would be very helpful in reducing the uncertainty here. Definitely, okay. For example. Cool. Uh, so can keep marching through. So we've got more description of all of the different objects that we uh, that we use to to run orbits, and then we've got some uh, an example uh, code. So uh, the code snippet here is a is a totally consistent working uh, orbit fit. So you can run an orbit fit using Opti. Uh, plot two different uh, figures uh, showing the results um, and save your posteriors in 21 lines of code, if that. <laughs> I guess I count lines, you can sort of count lines four through 12 as one line. So very few lines of code, you can, you can get everything running. So we wanted, we designed Orbitize to be uh, easy to use out of the box, but also very customizable. So you can right. do an orbit fit in as few as like five lines, but there's also this, this flexibility to add in additional data sets and make changes that you need. Cool. Uh, so figure three that I was just talking about before was, is an output from that code, that little, little snippet. And then this is the other output from the code. This is a, a, a corner plot using Dan Foreman Matthews corner package. Um, pretty standard. You have uh, you have a histogram showing the marginalized posteriors on the diagonal, and then two-dimensional covariances on the off-diagonals. So these are all of the free parameters in the fit that we ran. We have the um, the orbital parameters, semi-major axis, eccentricity, etc., and then we also have the parallax and the total mass in the system. So, as you can see, these these posteriors for directly imaged objects are wacky and wide. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wacky and wide, <laughs> the two W's. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it sort of drives the point home again that we need, uh, we need very efficient sampling algorithms to, to uh, sample this parameter space. So this was produced using Opti, the orbits for the impatient algorithm. Okay. Yeah, wild. Okay. So uh, here, where does uh, where does it go from here? Is there is there an orbitize exclamation mark exclamation mark? Is <laughs> are there more observational stuff that we need to do? What sort of look in your uh, crystal ball and what is it we need? Yeah, definitely. So there there's a lot of feature work for orbitize and. Uh, related science, which I think is really exciting. Uh, so some 
I guess first I'll talk about some of the updates we're making to the code. Uh, we are planning for an Orbitize 2.0. Uh, 1.0 was released, uh, I think, very close to this paper. Um, but we are planning for a big, uh, a big new release sometime maybe in the next year. Uh, and so some of the features that we'll, uh, we'll add in for this new release. First is uh, the ability to jointly fit radial velocities and, uh, and astrometry. That actually, that capability is currently implemented in Orbitize. So if you grab the latest version, it wasn't implemented when this paper was written, but it is now implemented. And this was due to Rob Tejada, who is an undergrad student right now. And he's gonna start his PhD at Princeton in the fall. Um, we are uh, also interested, another big uh, 2.0 milestone will be incorporating stellar astrometry. So we can do uh, use uh, data from Gaia and Hipparchos. Uh, we also have some code in the works to be able to fit uh, multi-planet and hierarchical systems. So uh, I have a summer, Jason Wong, the second author, and I have a summer student uh, working on this this summer. Her name is Sophia Covarubias. And uh, yeah, we have ideas to add additional backends as well, like a Hamiltonian MCMC and also uh, nested sampling. And yeah, so those are the main, we have other, we have other uh, updates planned, but those are, I would say, the major 2.0 milestones. Okay. Uh, there's lots of other science that we can do too. I think one of the most exciting next science cases is getting dynamical masses for directly imaged objects. Uh, so in order to get a dynamical mass, we need to, uh, we need another data set to break the degeneracy in the two-dimensional data that we have with astrometry. So the uh, two-dimensional orbit is just projected, the, a three, oh, is oh. the actual three-dimensional orbit projected onto the sky. Um, and so we, uh, we can break the degeneracy from two to three dimensions using radial velocities or uh, with Gaia, um, with stellar astrometry. Um, so Getting dynamical masses is really exciting for a lot of reasons. Uh, first, um, we can uh, sort of uh, directly uh, uh, corroborate the masses, the like model derived masses that uh, direct imagers usually sort of default to when, when you uh, are reporting on an object. So we'll be able to, to comment on the how uh, accurate the atmosphere models that people use to uh, to determine those masses are. Uh, second of all, uh, dynamical masses, uh, so that breaks the mass, uh, the mass age degeneracy in the luminosity of objects. Uh, so that's really exciting for um, determining the ages of young moving groups. This is something that Eric Nielsen's work, worked on a lot. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of other <laughs> reasons, but I guess I won't talk That's too great. much about those. Fantastic. So I see an interesting line here on um, Genesis, origin, that uh, <laughs> this package was born and developed at the winter 2018 and 2019 AAAS hack days. Mm -hmm. uh, so why don't you spill a little bit on that origin moment? How did that happen? Sure. <laughs> uh, so I guess th the first time that Orbitize was ever thought of uh, was actually before the AAS hack day. So Jason Wong and I had a conversation also with Eric Nielsen at, uh, I think it was the Know Thy Star conference in 2018. So this was like September 2018. Okay. And Jason said something like, so I had been, I had worked on the orbits for the impatient algorithm and I had like a, an IDL implementation. And Jason said something like, it would be so cool if we had, you know, orbits for the impatient and MCMC in one package together so that you didn't have to like, you know, write a whole new code every time you wanted to use one algorithm or the other. And I agreed that that was cool. And we realized we were both going to AAS that year and there was a hack day. And I think we, we both, I can't remember if we signed up like with this in mind or we just signed up and then thought it would be a good idea to start working on this package there. Uh, but yeah, Jason and I just spent 
you know, a bunch of hours, like most of the time was coming up with the name, actually. <laughs> uh, we didn't spend a lot of time during the hack day actually coding. Uh, the name of the package time. is important. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's a branding, it's, it's, it's important. <laughs> Definitely. That's so cool. <clears throat> That's so cool. Well, um, I wish Orbitize a happy and well-used bright future. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks again for inviting me. This is really fun. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your lovely paper and your awesome software package with us. And that'll do for this one, everyone. So thank you so much. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.